Uh, what are we talking about? Let's start uh, with uh, very general definitions. What is a random group on a group? Okay, so you have a group which I assume is financial generator. And I have uh, some, uh, okay, it's, it's financial generator, that means that it has a finite set of generators, so let's call it F, or you know, it's a, it's a choice. And we always assume that it's a method, which would mean that our random work would be reversible, so you know, we have a lot of all the tools of reversible random work in our arsenal. And we define the Cayley graph. Okay, that's the important notion. Okay, I can speak about that. The e vertices are just the elements of the group, and the edges put an edge between any for Basically, the degree of the graph is the size of the generating set. For every element of the group, you put an edge. One edge corresponds to every element of, of, uh, of the group. And we want to understand random walk on this kind of uh, on this kind of graphs. Both in general, but this talk will be about specific the specific case of the symmetric group, the group of permutations of n. So there is an interesting uh, difference between infinite groups and uh, and finite groups, and even more specifically the symmetric group. If the group is infinite, the way people work is assuming that actually the choice of S doesn't matter. Of course, you have, there are many choices of S. In fact, that uh, you can choose uh, you take the whole group if you want, uh, if it's finite. Okay, or if it's not, if it's infinite. There are many choices. So it's like you. For example, if you look at the random walk in, uh, say, uh, d-dimensional space, it doesn't really matter which lattice you take. You know, it matters in some detail, but it doesn't matter for things like recurrence, transients, existence of CLP. The choice of which lattice, which is exactly the choice of generating set, doesn't matter. Okay? And this is a philosophy that has been checked for many questions and for many kinds of groups, not just for the groups uh, d. Uh, it's also a <coughs> beautiful open problem about whether Harnack inequality is a good property, but let's not uh, discuss that. So, uh, let me be it. So, now, on the other hand, in this particular case, the choice of generating set, set matters. There's no doubt about it. You know, there are great differences in the asymptotics of the mixing time and of many other properties that you would be interested for in for a random walk. On a finite, on a finite set. So we are definitely don't know what is the most interesting uh, uh, generating set to take. I will focus on a specific family in this talk, but there is a lot of richness here and a lot of open problems. And and, uh, and you would like to have questions about, you know, how we tell generators. What's true for no matter which set of generators? You would like to know what happens when you take random random generators take two random permutations, then it's a not so difficult theorem that uh, with high probability they generate the group. But how does the Kelly graph look? Is it an expansion? That's not known. <coughs> now, a consumacy graph, okay, now I assume I have to say that. A conjugacy class means that uh, uh, if the, the set, the structure, the set does not depend depends only on the cycle structure. So for example, if you have, a, for example, one uh, cycle of plane four, then you must have all of them. If you have one in your generating set, if you have one, trans one uh, permutation which just exchanges two elements and does nothing to the left, then you must have all of them. So the set should be invariant to renaming the vertices. And these are very interesting generating sets, and uh, was the the center of a lot of, of research to understand, you know, what can we say about in this case. And the main topic of this talk are generating sets, are generating sets which are consistent, consisting only of transposition. So transposition means is a permutation which just exchanges two elements and nothing else. And all the rest are, uh, remains uh, in their place. Is this clear? Okay. So, and you will see different questions and different answers for all of these cases. Why be, why inter be, be interested in SM? What's so special about SM? So there are a number of reasons to discuss this particular group. 
The first is obviously, uh, is the most entertaining, is card shuffling. If you have lots of uh, standard uh, algorithm for card shuffling, like <coughs> shuffle or uh, other things can be expressed as a random open SM. Uh, uh, the, the result of diaphanous and the, Made it to the New York to the New York Times because uh, you know they proved that the seven shufflers are enough. That this was after what, some controversy or that it's buyer, David buyer. Buyer, right, right, right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Another reason are interacting particle systems. You will see that later. There are a number of interacting particle systems which can be mapped to one or more. <coughs> and uh, a third reason that. Magnet mail, uh, no magnet, okay, sorry. No, no, no misspelled, I just, okay, let's just skip. So now, there is con a connection between quantum models, I will not talk about it all in this talk, so I'm just, you know, it's just a, 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 a one, uh, just a bullet point, <laughs> but uh, there is a, the number of quantum models that can be mapped uh, to the, to random, to a question on random work on the symmetry group, in particular, the quantum Heisenberg ferromagnet, also the anti okay, was a focus for of a lot of research. <laughs> and the fourth, and maybe the least uh, <coughs> natural for this organ, is the following. <coughs> Suppose you want to understand random walks on the group of linear transformations over a finite field of size p of degree k. Now, there is a very, very develop theory of what happens when you take P to infinity fixing K. This has been, you know, ever since uh, Filsenberg in the 60s and, and, and Margulis and everybody worked on that and it, the, the, an enormous amount of stuff is in. Okay? But if you fix me and let K go to infinity, our knowledge is very, very partial. And there's a philosophy that studying Xn has similar difficulties to studying SLPK getting K, the right K asymptotics. Okay, so I, I will not discuss this in this talk at all, but, but it's a point that it is good to keep in mind that, uh, that, that the getting the right bounds for random moves in SLK, right in terms, meaning right asymptotically in K, bound on random open SLK team have an enormous amount of issues and, and uh, we are very far from that. Okay, <laughs> so let's start with, uh, with the case of arbitrary jet particles. That, and here there is a beautiful conjecture, which is still open. I call it Babai because a lot of people attribute it to Babai, but I think it's actually very old conjecture. I'm not sure that Babai was the first to, to actually. Okay, anyway, people attributed to Babay, but it's definitely more than 40 years old, no question about it. And it says that any, for any choice of generators of the symmetric group, the diameter would be, the di should I define the diameter? Just the largest distance between two points by the largest, the longest, okay? So, <laughs> no, should I define what's the diameter? No, okay. Uh, of any k graph is, is polynomial. I, we don't care that at our present uh, uh, knowledge, we don't really care what's the constant. Once we show that there is a constant, then we will care about its value. But at this point, even the existence of the constant is open. If somebody will prefer mixing times, then it's completely equivalent to asking whether the mixing time is polynomial. Because uh, up, to, uh, up to two in the value of the constant is the same. And this is still open, let me tell you what is known about this exciting conjecture. So the worst example is this generating set. So you have one transposition, I hope everyone is familiar with, the generating set has only, has only three elements. So I forgot to write the inverse of this guy, right? They're only always talking about the symmetric uh, generating set. So this guy is its own inverse, it's just uh, exchanging one and two, so that's its own inverse, but this is of course not, its inverse would not be uh, a cycle, but in the cycle in the opposite direction. <coughs> I hope you'll forgive me for not putting it. So the size of the set has three elements. It's not difficult to show that it generates the group. I leave it you know, all as an exercise. 
and this is the end of the end square. <coughs> and mixing time in Q if somebody likes mixing time because mixing time is to the end. Okay, is this example clear? Clear what is the set? Good. So uh, I wrote the permutations in the cycle notation. Now the best known general result is the following is that is okay, it's bigger than polynomial, but much, much less smaller than exponent. So ignore the log log, nobody cares about that. <laughs> exponent of, of log to the four. So or if you want n to power log to the three. Okay, that's the best known result. The result is very difficult, it's also quite new. Oh, this one. Uses the classification of the finite uh, simple groups. Uh, I prepared a little aside on why, uh, where it is used and what the theorem, but uh, since it's the morning after the conference dinner, let me uh, skip that. <laughs> Just, you should know that there, it's a point that uh, requires discussion. Uh, here's another general result which I like a lot. Suppose one of the generators has support smaller than uh, one third n. So, for example, this here, or this generator has, <laughs> has support two. So, let's suppose it's just the number of guys which are moved. Okay, so for that, this guy has support n, but this guy has support two, which is definitely smaller than third n for most interesting n. Then the diameter is smaller than n to the h. So that's a very general result. Shows you apply this to many interesting cases. And here's one result for random generators. Um, it shows that the diameter is smaller than n squared. But, of course, it's conjectured actually to be an expander, in which case the diameter would be log of the size of the group, or log n factorial, mean n log n. So, of course, with high probability, okay, I didn't write that, so. Okay, questions about this, uh, this slide? Solutions for Bubba's conjecture? Okay. Show it to me. Okay, so now let's move to uh, transpositions. Actually, it's an intersection of two because uh, the result I'm going to talk about is both transpositions and the conjugacy class. <laughs> so it's an intersection. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Okay, so now we take transpositions, so elements which have changed one, uh, two elements, but we take all of them. So it's a a, 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 a conjugation construction. Actually, we already heard about this result in uh, a Yard's talk on, on Tuesday. I think Tuesday, somebody remembers. So, what did Agnes and Shashani put for, uh, for this particular set of uh, generators? It's a set of generators of size n choose 2. Um, so, he showed uh, what Yard called, well, uh, what everyone called the sharp cup. So, what, what does it mean? If you, let, if you let the walk go a little bit less than, n, than half n log n, so for any positive epsilon, you just take half minus epsilon n log n steps, and you compare it to, well, what happens after infinity many steps, which is basically a uniform, so p infinity, so the pt is the what happens after these steps, but p infinity is just uniform, right? All permutations have equal probability. Then, there are still, and these, uh, did I write it? Yeah, this, this is a total variation distance. Then they are still very far away. So you are still not at all mixed. Okay, you are still as far from the uniform measure as when you start. Essentially. Okay? And uh, this, actually, this actually is easy. You just count how many uh, stationary points, and uh, that's, not the, that's not the point about this. The point is the opposite, the, uh, the second clause, which says that when you are just slightly more than half, <laughs> then you are already mixed. Then the, 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 then the distance from uniform becomes very small. If you remember from the stop, he had lots of pictures that looked like that. <laughs> now that's not an elephant swallowing, uh, uh, that's not a snake swallowing an elephant. This is a graph of the total variation distance as a function of the time. So here, at half minus epsilon, let me not write the n, n uh, log n, it's still, the distance is still very large, and at half plus epsilon, it's already very small, so the, the window in which it moves from very large, from close to one to close to zero, 
uh, is the O small of N of N. In fact, it's uh, of order of N. And this is called the <coughs> threshold, and as you saw in uh, ARs, people are interested in that. And this was generated, generalized for other conjugacy classes by various people. Uh, I don't think anyone can show this. Uh, it's not the best city that's in the audience. <laughs> and uh, okay, so how did they pull? So they pulled it using the presentation theory. Now, and I, I like to think about the presentation theory as a kind of Fourier transform. So let's let's just uh, write it on the blackboard. Huh. Since I have such a nice blackboard, I should I should definitely use it. So. It's not the usual way it comes from, of course, but some kind of generalized, non commutative uh, analog. But still, it's very useful to think about it as a full way from form. Okay, so, so, uh, so let's see. So we have a function on your group, on the symmetric group, and we define f way from Here you see I bothered to put some quotes. Uh, imagine that they are there also. And it still satisfies that the Fourier transform of the convolution is a product of the Fourier transform, which means that for your heat, your heat kernel is a power. So it's a, a very tempting to use that. It sounds very similar to how we prove things on random walking in, in, uh, on Z. But there is a catch. These guys, the values of the Fourier transform are not numbers, but matrices. <laughs> and the product in these formulas here and here and this power are matrix powers. That's probably much less uh, pleasant than the usual case where you just uh, need to calculate the Fourier transform of your generator and just you know take the powers. That's not sounds a little bit bad. But when f okay is a, okay class function is the same as conjugacy. Uh, I'm sorry about the, the use of two two different names in the same thing. So when it's a class function that is, that is the, like in the case of that in Shashani, then the matrices are just scalar matrices. So it's just some number of times that you get. And then you are back at uh, uh, essentially it's well, it's a bit uh, cheating for me to say that, but you know, it's essentially uh, you you basically it's as simple as the non as a commutative case, as doing calculations in not in practice, but in theory. <laughs> now, no, you don't have to, uh, to multiply matrices. You just have to be able to calculate the Fourier transform, and then you take a power. And this is what the Atlas and Shashani did. The values of f hat, they, they've been known since, uh, since the beginning of the 20th century, so that they just had to, uh, OK, and take these formulas of Cobanius and, and uh, and those are not completely equivalent of this, but then eventually that's how they put it. So this is your first take-home message. <coughs> okay? The presentation theory, or non commutative Fourier transform, is great if your generating set is a class function, is invariant for conjugation. You can do explicit calculations and you can get results. But that's not the not always the case. So here's the, when did I start? But well, okay, let's do that. So this slide is really for people who know a bit of representation theory but don't know what I mean by Fourier consumption. So I don't know how many, most maybe, I guess a lot of people here in the audience will simply ignore this slide. Definitely everyone can ignore this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, what do I, I close? So, so, so the point is that f hat. Well, I never told you f hat of what. <laughs> I just told you it's a function, and you can take the, the point where it's for it. But I didn't say it's a function. That I didn't say what is the domain. I just said what's the range of the function. So at this slide, it tells you uh, what's the domain. The domain are irreducible representations. I will not spend too much time on that. I will just, because, you know, if you haven't seen this before, 
but it, it will not help you. And if you have this, is, this formula is the only thing that you need to know. So let's let's keep this slide actually. Uh, but let me just note the following: that there is a possible formula. So in some sense, and the, and the, and the, in some sense, the L two norm of the Fourier transform is the same as the L two norm. We can have some appropriate norm for the matrices, the Schmidt <coughs> norm is not important, and there's some constant also. And, and also there is a Fourier inversion formula. So we have a lot of analogs of the usual Fourier, Fourier uh, transform. Okay, now what are the yield? Now, as I said, the domain of F are the yield usable representations, but that's a very you know, abstract definition. How do we look for this metal group? Uh, well, they are indexed by partitions. So number, is, uh, you have a sequence of decreasing number which sum to one. And this, uh, by the way, people use this notation. I don't think I will. I use it a lot in this uh, talk, but uh, notice this notation is that sigma is a partition of n. I never even, I can't even myself, I can't even remember which direction it should go. <coughs> I hope this is the correct one. Anyway, I check <laughs> the slide, so probably it's the correct one. And people draw it like uh, with nice, uh, with nice uh, diagrams. So this is the partition of six into five plus one. And people draw it like a row of five row of boxes, and then uh, a second row of five. Five. This is, and the third example demonstrates another notation, which is if I take put a power, then this means just repeat the same value three times. So this means that five is two plus one plus one plus one. And this is an, another graphical representation of the same. And the reusable representations are indexed by, represent by these partitions. Unfortunately, I, I have no time to, uh, to at all explain how you get from an irreducible representation, the, from a partition to an irreducible representation. This is quite complicated. Fortunately, okay, this uh, the last sentence that just appeared on, on is, is very personal. I have to tell you, I worked maybe two years in this business. This will forever see a Spetz model, or, or, or a, a basically before seeing the, uh, a, a, the actual definition of a representation of an irreducible or the general definition of an irreducible representation. So you can go a long way just by facts that we know about them without actually going into the details of the construction. So there's a, 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 some, some, some message of hope in this last sentence. Okay. Okay, now we go to the steering process. Uh, it's a different way to think about the Cayley graph. Uh, it's just a, a different name, essentially, for a Cayley graph, which is generated by transpositions. But it's a very, very uh, tempting uh, way to look at things. We think about it, if it's a Cayley graph that's generated by transpositions, then you can think about it as an interacting particle system. So, so, it's particles are moving on a graph, a small graph, a graph of size n, right? Our graphs are of size n factorial. The k graph has size n factorial, but you think about it as particles moving on a much smaller graph, a graph of size n, with one edge for every transposition that you put in your generating set. And a uh, and, the, and what do you do? You, start, you put four some clocks on the edges. When the clock rings, you exchange. Actually, there is some uh, simulation which has a slight probability of walking in the next. In the next, uh, let's see. This is mm, no. <laughs> okay, no simulations. <laughs> um, too bad about that, but I just have to draw it. So you take your graph, any graph that you like. For example, uh, for various reasons, uh, it's very natural to take a cube in uh, two or three dimensions. You put particles on on the on the <coughs> vertices. The particles are all different. It's not an exclusion. The particles are all different. You put four some clocks on the edges, and when an, e an edge rings, you exchange the two marbles or particles, okay? And 
it's easy to see that it's exactly the same as random walk on the telegraph up, uh, in continuous time. So this is most easy to uh, explain, uh, to define continuous time. Then you do, uh, uh, let me do, uh, oh, it's okay. So this is, uh, okay, there's some definition of the Prussian and uh, continuous time. If somebody doesn't know it, then I hope he has enough time to read it. And the reason why it's useful to do in continuous time is because if you trace one particle, it just does continuous time simple random walk. Or, which is the same as tracing where the permutation takes one average. So it allows to easily compare random walk on a small graph and random walk on the k-graph, which is much larger, and this is very, uh, very useful. <coughs> and here, and also it allows you to define it on infinite graphs. Usually, for basically, uh, if the graph has a boundary degrees, then it's a well-defined process on the infinite graph. And now we have a conjecture, which is still open again, so I'm giving you a lot of uh, homework today. This is by Babbitt from 1993, uh, and it says that if you do the process on this particular infinite graph, again, this is not a k-graph, it's a k-graph, but this is not the k-graph of the S, and this is the small graph, and, the, and we are doing random walk on permutations of Z3, of, of elements of Z3, then there is a phase transition in time. So there is a different behavior after short time <coughs> and after long time that you run the process. And what is exactly the phase transition? Uh, if the time is sufficiently short, then there are only this permutation has only finite cycles. So if you go start from some point and you start applying the permutation that you get after, so you run the process for 0.1 seconds, you stop. You have now a permutation of the initial and final positions of the particles. Uh, and now it's a permutation, so it has cycle structures. The cycles, but since it's an infinite function, a permutation of infinitely many elements, it could also have infinite paths where you know phi of phi of zero and phi of phi of zero and phi of phi of phi of, phi of zero and so on are all different. Okay? And the conjecture is that. For small time, it doesn't happen. All cycles are fine. But for long time, it actually does happen. There's, okay, there are, all, there are still some finite cycles, but there are also infinite cycles. <coughs> okay, is the, is the conjecture clear? It's okay if it's slightly poopy. <laughs> it's essentially a conjecture. Okay. Okay, again, I will not go into quantum mechanics at all. Uh, <laughs> taking a, quite a lot of time as it is. And what's not? First of all, the first, the small time is easy. There is a very easy argument for in any graph, no problem. The problem is to show, not just the phase transition, but just to show that if you take the, you know, like 10 million, there are infinite cycles. That's completely unknown for this three. So I, I embellish the, the conjecture by requiring a, a sharp transition, but even the existence of a, well, I guess it would be an order phase, it's not known. Um, okay, okay, that's what I just said. Um, now, if you replace the graph by a tree, then actually uh, it's, uh, there's a lot known. There is uh, one partial result by Omer from 2003, and then this, are, this is not a preprint from 2013, but two papers, one that's already published in 2013, and the other one which is still a preprint. Uh, both by, uh, by Alan Hammond. So on a two, we, we still don't know as much as we'd like, but we know a lot. Let me give to more details on, on, on this result. Now, of course, even though the uh, original conjecture is for infinite graphs, it has an analog for finite graphs. So we are going back to SN, and now you take an R in R by R by R cube, and you can do it, uh, you can take a torus if you like, that doesn't, I, I don't believe that matters, and you examine again the, string, the cycle structure of your permutation, the same thing, and of course, oh, okay, at small time, okay, this is uh, written in a slightly <laughs> confusing way, so at small time, you should have a typical cycle, should have finite size, it should have exponentially decaying distribution, 
And in particular, the largest would be logarithmic. But actually, the interesting fact is that the typical would be constant, not that the larger would be logarithmic. But I don't know. I don't want it to fix that at some point. And maybe it's an old version of the presentation. Anyway, and on the other hand, at large time, you have cycles which are not just <coughs> larger than constant, as would be like the analog of, of, of the infinite graph, but actually they co occupy a constant amount of the volume. That's what people believe holds for uh, after the transition point. Not only, it's not that you have like uh, cycles which are, would be infinite in the limit, but are still quite small, but actually you have cycles which span a constant amount of the volume. Okay, and there are lots of results, so uh, most of them are for the complete graph. So here are like four results for the complete graph. In particular, the paper of Schramm is fantastic. Really a, a masterpiece. But uh, let me not discuss that in, in uh, and it doesn't choose the presentation theory. Even though it's the complete graph, so I just told you the complete graph, uh, it's a conjugacy class, so uh, it's a class function, so the presentation theory would be useful. So the presentation theory was used in these last two papers where I, uh, where I managed to destroy everything, but not in these first two papers, which are uh, the probabilistic in nature. So this is a problem, definitely a problem that can also be attacked without the presentation theory. That's part of its charm. It's not clear at this point what's the best attack vector. Maybe there is proof of this conjecture using pure probability. I'm advocating, you know, I like the presentation theory approach, but I, I definitely am not claiming that it's the only game in town. Um, so here's the version that can be done completely algebraically, and I think it's entertaining. Okay, we want to know what's the probability that you have a large cycle, say n half, n third, n two thirds, I don't know exactly. Let's start with the probability that the probability is just one enormous cycle. That it's just a cycle that goes through all the points. Okay, so again, what's the clear question? You take the steering process, you run it for time t, you ask, what's the probability that you, the permutation you get has no fixed point, it's just one large cycle going around the Turns out that it has an exact point. And here's the formula, this is the result which John with Gil alone. There was, a, by the way, an alone in one of the previous slides. Always here alone is not no alone, but uh, uh, this uh, very uh, nice uh, guy called Gil alone. And we have a precise formula for the probability. This is not a, this is the first time in my life that I put something which doesn't have a, which is not an inequality with an arbitrary constant <laughs> <laughs> before. So, so this probability, which I just defined, is equal to one over n times, and these lambda i's they are eigenvalues of the smaller. That's the fun thing about this formula. There are not eigenvalues of the Kelly graph, there are n, n factorial numbers which nobody knows how to calculate. There are eigenvalues of the cube, which is some cosine, so everything is completely calculated. And let's do some, uh, but, but the formula works on any graph. So lambda i are the eigenvalues of the Laplacian of the graph. Let's do some uh, uh, sanity checks. So as t goes to infinity, all these guys go to zero. So the product goes to one. So it's just equal to one over n, which is good. That's exactly the probability when you take a uniform distribution. If you haven't seen that, take that as an exercise. When you have a completely uniform permutation, the probability that it's one large cycle is one over n. So that's one. Now here's a very fun fact. When you take t to zero, here you get something like t lambda i. So you get basically t to n minus one product of the lambda i. Well, here, a little bit of analysis will give you a sum over 3. So you get this new proof of the matrix 3 theory. I don't know if everyone knows it's a matrix 3 theory. It says that the determinant of a certain kind of matrices can be written as a sum over 3. It's a classical uh, combinatorial theorem. This is a proof which I, uh, doesn't seem to be used to any number. <laughs> OK, so how do we prove that? Though I didn't, didn't even dare to call it a proof sketch. You know, a sketch is something that an expert can uh, complete uh, by what's written. Definitely nobody can complete a proof from what, what will be this like. But I want basically to show a skeleton. What goes into the proof? What are the, main, uh, the two main pieces? OK, so this is a probability of some event. So as a probability, it's just you know the inner product of the indicator of the event times the interval. Right? 
that's just with definition. And using parser val identity, we can write it as a in a product of this Fourier transform, which I didn't define and I didn't show how to calculate, and nobody knows anything. I know it doesn't <coughs> really very useful at this point. Okay, but Q, what's Q? What's the event? It's the event that the permutation is length n. That's a class function. Okay? We only care about the cycle structure. We want it to be n. So it's a class function. So its full console is scalar matrices. So this inner product, which in general, is just taking two matrices and then taking the trace of the product. Again, remember, these full transforms are matrices is much more pleasant because on the other side, on this side, it, it just num it's just a number multiplied by, okay, the trace of this guy. This guy is, we don't, is not a class function and we don't understand the structure, but at least this guy is a class function and this is just the identity matrix. And not only these are numbers, these are numbers which can be calculated. And this is the main uh, content of the paper, is the calculation of this guy. And then, first of all, it's almost always zero. So that's great. We immediately, even before getting the precise formula, we see that we don't, that the addition of this guy means that we don't have to calculate this guy on all, on all, on all, on all uh, representations. Okay? Because this is zero on almost all representations. So it saves us a lot of calculations on the other side. So that's nice. But what's even nicer is the ones which are not zero are the ones which have which have one row, one column, one row, and one column. And that's it. Okay, so it's a, 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 a partition of n of the form n is equal to n minus k plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one k times. Okay. Okay, so I guess people here are wondering what's so special about hook shape. The hook shapes are very special. There's a formula which is, well, okay, a lot, but I always get the, if, there's a, if there would be anyone in the audience which knows the presentation here, it would just skewer me on writing that. Um, the, the, this, yeah, it's in Bashel's paper, but uh, it's just uh, one small lemma in a much more interesting thing that he does, and, uh, and uh, in, a, in a way it's classical. So. The point is that these representations are special. There is a formula for that, for this guy, which only works in these representations. Maybe I, I should be like that, rather than assuming you, you all have the same view on, on uh, So, F hat, these are special. Let me just put this as kind of a, 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 a memory from this from this uh, from this slide. There is something very special about uh, these uh, these shapes. They have an explicit formula, and the and the formula on the top of the slide is followed from this formula and the calculate and this calculation. Okay, that's all I want to say about the book. I know you can complete this. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so let's. Uh, so, okay, so we have an exact formula. So, okay, let's try to check if uh, we believe uh, Banning's conjecture. Right? So, uh, so, this formula allows us to find exact this. So, first of all, I don't know to do this calculation, but now this is a calculation which definitely everyone can do at home. You just put the eigenvalues of the Q, and, and which are cosine, and put it into the formula and do a bit of matching. It turns out, and you see that, and that you get a picture not quite like, <coughs> like in, in uh, AR's talk. You get a picture which is more, a bit more, uh, a bit more, it's like the other picture in AR's talk. <laughs> So you don't have a sharp cutoff, but you do have, you know, well, okay, maybe I should uh, write it opposite. Okay, in, in the other talk, it was always, always looked like this, but maybe I will, okay, let's see it like that. Okay, now let's draw it over. <laughs> okay, so this is the probability. It starts at zero, or very, very close to zero, and then goes to its eventual value, which is one over n. And when you try to calculate 
what's the point in which it, it goes? Now, if you believe Banach's conjecture, then you would definitely assume that this happens at approximately constant time. <coughs> but when you do the calculation, <coughs> you see that it happens at uh, R square time. So, so that's a bit disappointing. But when you think about it a bit, you, you understand that you were just you were just too optimistic to start with. So, uh, okay, that's what I said. said. Uh, being one enormous cycle is not something typical. It, it gives, it, it requires everyone to move. Right? So, in particular, to touch everyone, which is just by this fact that you have to touch everyone, immediately shows that it cannot happen at constant time. So, being having a cycle of length and half is much more flexible. Some guys don't want to move, let them stay at home, let them stay where they are. I'll construct my end half cycle using the guys that, that you know, that, you know, cooperate, uh, they are cooperative guys. But if you want the one big cycle, you have, must have cooperation from each and every part in the system. So uh, it's still, um, so it wasn't a priori to be expected that transition would happen at constant time. And let me do you know that it still happens before the mixing time of the whole chain. That's uh, one of the charms of this question. That it's a question that about you know quick mixing, about aspects of the system that mix before the mixes. The system mixes in the usual mixing time sense that all the mixing time guys are doing. So this is still before the mixing time of the whole chain, which is R squared of L, but not by much. It's not by constant. Okay, so we have to take this approach somehow and try to apply to smaller cycles and half. Let's even start with n minus 1. Okay, now we can see already the doom in the title. Let's try to do that for n minus 1 and just one pixel. Okay, now you remember that the starting point, there were two elements in the proof that was two slides ago. One was to calculate this guy. And then it was zero except in the hooks, and then it was this element. This element can still be done. We have an exact formula, it's in the same paper with Gill. But so you can still calculate the Fourier transform of the indicator of the event completely precisely. It's not too bad. It's uh, and it's still zero almost on all of the uh, representation, except but this time they have two rows and one column. That doesn't sound too bad. But <coughs> even if you take one cube <laughs> off the hook, <laughs> your hook, okay, so <laughs> this cube is stupid ball play. Not only you cannot expect a more complicated formula, it's not even a function of the eigenvalues of the graph. It's of course a function of the graph, but it's not a function of the eigenvalues of the graph. You can find two isospectral graphs, so graphs which have exactly the same spectrum. But with different fluids, just you find a counter example already for four particles. That's very sculpture. So only for four particles, you can find two graphs with exactly the same spectrum, not the first same spectral graph, the same spectrum, all eigenvalues of the same, but different uh, full transform in this you oh, and like n equal to four, there is just one representation which is not a hook, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just this one, one interval and all of the ones there. So this probability, or okay, not this, but the analog, analogous probability for a cycle of length n minus one is not a function of the eigenvalues. What are the graphs? We just found them by computer cells, so they're not nice. We didn't use any of this either spectrality uh, uh, theory of Lubotsky and all his, uh, all the, all his friends. Okay, but I don't want you to, to, to think I'm completely moved to the dark side here. Okay, I'm still an analyst. So, if you can calculate, you could... That it, I am happy that you cannot calculate. If you can calculate, then maybe you can estimate. So, how do we... Uh, so, we can still estimate... Maybe you can estimate these guys, so that they are small, so that they... You know, do some analysis. You know, nobody, you know, nobody promises a, a garden of water. So, so okay. How much time do I have actually? Zero minutes. Ah, that's perfect. 
Okay, so, <laughs> so here's a slide with a number of analytical results. Okay, since I have zero minutes, I will not actually, uh, actually describe them in too much detail, but anyway, I didn't plan to describe them in too much detail. So, so, uh, so this is the famous Alves conjecture, I'm sure plenty of people heard about that. But I'm telling what all, all I'm telling you here is that Aldous conjecture has <coughs> is in fact an inequality for eigenvalues in the Fourier transform. So this very so this deep theorem of Caputo limit and Richter is actually tells us gives us a lot of interesting information about the same eigenvalues that we need to estimate. And then I quote a few more results of uh, one with Gill, which is already published, but a different paper, it's, uh, just by chance, the same year. A different paper with Gill, and also some, a number of uh, uh, unpublished results. So let me not discuss that. Anyway. Okay? So the, the, the bottom line of this, of this slide is that we, have, we do have analytic information on the eigenvalues. So, so here's your last take home method, which is. Speculative at this point. <laughs> Even if it's not a class function, you can use analytical methods. We still don't have like a result with an exclamation mark, which will tell us, okay, here the algebra analytic uh, approach uh, works. Here is a wonderful result that you couldn't do otherwise. So we still don't have, we have lots of results, but nothing with an ex exclamation mark here. So I am marking this take home method as speculative, but. Uh, but uh, uh, but I have some faith in this. 